This podcast is part of the Bible Thumping Wingnut Network. Biblical Christianity's marketplace of ideas. BibleThumpingWingnut.com Hello and you're listening to Polemics Report for July 8, 2019. This is your host, J.D. Hall. This is the program we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting to sinners, and edifying to the saints. And this is the program with sincere questions and biblical answers. Thanks so much for sending me your sincere questions. If you have more of them, send them to jd at polemicsreport.com. I'll do my best to give you a biblical answer. That's jd at pulpit and pen dot, is it dot com or dot, it's dot org, actually. And go to that website, pulpit and pen dot org, for your latest in polemics news. We are, by far, the largest and best read polemics news site in the world, at least Christian polemics news. There's not very many people who even do what we do, but among them, uh, we are the Rolex of polemics blogs, and if we boast, boast in the Lord. We're thankful for what he's allowed us to do or what he has done through us. You should see the emails that we get on a daily basis of people who say who say that, Reading polemics is opening their mind to good theology, shutting their mind to what is bad theology, and teaching them to reason from the scripture, to be Bereans, to do exactly what uh, we're told by the author of Hebrews to do in Hebrews chapter 5, to train the powers of our discernment with constant practice so that we might be skilled in the word of righteousness. Also, thank you to those Patreon supporters that help us do what it is that we can do. You can support us on Patreon for $5.95 a month, $34.95 a month. If you do that, you'll get a free t-shirt from the Reformed Gear store. Or for $49.95 a month, get a book from another one of our sponsors, Crown and Cross Books. They specialize in rare printings or printings of rare theological books that you really can't find anywhere else. So be the envy of all of your theology nerd friends by getting those books for $49.95 a month from Pulpit and Pen. And uh, again, support us there on Patreon or just make a one-time financial gift. Do you know what the gospel is? The gospel that is of first importance, Paul says, is that Christ Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and according to the scriptures, he rose again from the dead. When we do polemics, we do it for the purpose, A, of discipleship, but also, B, for the purpose of evangelism. People need to know what the good news of the gospel is, and a lot of the time, if they're in a false sub-Christian sect, they have to find out that what they believe is actually false, so that there's room, like in their heart, for them to believe that which is true. Sometimes people have to learn what the counterfeit is for them to believe that which is good, the way, the truth, and the life, that is, Jesus Christ. By the way, you should repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost on account of the forgiveness of your sins. And as always, I want to point out that polemics or discernment is a field of theological study where we take what people are saying in the name of God, then we compare that to the Word of God. But discernment is both a spiritual gift given to individuals, and also it is a, it is a skill that can be acquired and honed. So we train the powers of that discernment, but some people just have a special knack for it, for lack of a better word. They're just specially discerning. That would be someone who has the spiritual gift of discernment, and the reason why you've been given that is for the edification of the local church. And so this program and the Rolex of Plymix Blogs Pulpit and Pen is only for local church members. If you're not a local church member, it's not for you. We're trying to bless and to help and to equip local churches. So find a good one and be a part of it. So thanks for listening to Polemics Report on Monday, again, July something something 8, 2019. If you go over to the website, you'll see the articles that were published today. Let's see here. We have uh, Jack Graham preaches sermon claiming that socialism is incompatible with Christianity, which, by the way, uh, it is because of the Eighth Commandment, which presumes private property rights ownership uh, or private property ownership. And uh, let's see here, Paula White says, and I think we'll cover this one today, it says that it's illegal for God to do anything on earth without your partnership. 
We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, Jim Baker says he was put into prison because the government was afraid of his presidential endorsement. He was going to endorse Pat Robertson. What was that, back in 84? Or was that 88? No, 80. It might have been 88. Was he running against George W. Bush? Uh, or, or George H.W. Bush? Anyways, uh, yeah, Jim Baker says that's why he was thrown in prison. The government was afraid of who he might endorse for president of the United States, you know, on account of the deep state, at which point the rest of us go, actually, actually, you were engaged in a real estate scam and Ponzi scheme in which it was discovered that you were using tax-deductible donations for this Ponzi scheme to pay off a woman, I think it was $270,000, not to talk about the fact that you gang raped her with another pastor, and then you evaded taxes, so you got thrown into jail for that. Yeah, that's actually what that was for. So when people shove stuff down the memory hole, it's pulpit and pen that like casts are real and then like, uh, or, or our line, and then and then we, we reel it back in from the memory hall. It's one of the things that we do in polemics, documenting the past for the sake of the future. Uh, Jim Baker, uh, no, 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 next one. Uh, Paula White says wherever she steps, uh, it becomes holy ground. This was an article by Bill Perkins, uh, Beth Moore, and Harry Emerson Fosdick. Shall the fundamentalist win? Good article. Not very sensational, but well written. Mark Driscoll is peddling signed copies of his sermon notes. Yeah. So if you, if you uh, do X, Y, and Z and jump through a fiery hoop, you can, uh, you can get a copy of his sermon notes. I believe, I'm trying, I think this might have been one of the pulpit and pen admins that posted a response. If not, sorry to whoever the reformed music man is. Is that Risco? I think it's Risco. He said, like you're important or something, I buy, I buy my toilet paper at Costco. That was Andrew's response. Not very nice, Andrew. I don't care for your tone. Uh, let's see. Homosexuals rally around Beth Moore as she softens her stance on sodomy. So we're going to look at that. As a matter of fact, we might just do that first. And then uh, a worldly church takes a Sabbath from from the Sabbath. All right. Uh, oh, oh, and let's not forget this one. Uh, an anti-Semite sets self on fire. <laughs> See, you have to admit that polemics is entertaining sometimes. Uh, an anti-Semite sets themselves on fire for trying to blow up a synagogue. And if I click on that, you'll look at this guy's face and go, I can see that. <laughs> if you're, okay, so gasoline is combustible. You don't want to, what, this is going to happen to you. You see his face. <laughs> Sorry, it's just so stupid. Um, where did I say we we're going to start? Oh, homosexuals rally around Beth Moore. So we know that Beth Moore has softened her stance on homosexuality. We know that she has deleted articles, uh, or rather passages, from books that were critical of homosexuality. We know that she's given several different explanations as to why, but they all amount to emotional pleading, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And so uh, what you might not know is that the homosexuals are... Uh, they are rallying around her, along with another group of people, like Ed Stetzer mm, and the Gospel Coalition boys. So, here's what's happened. Because Beth Moore has done the two-step uh, in the beating around the bush Olympics on homosexuality, she has two major groups that are supporting her. If you want to know whether or not she's right or wrong, you know, birds of a feather flock together. The first one... The first group supporting her are the woke social justice guys that use and abuse her as a propagandic tool to win over the hearts and minds of desperate housewives who have bad pastors and rely upon Beth Moore to get some semblance of biblical teaching and don't have a godly husband at home to say, stop, that's bad. Go make me a sandwich. No, just kidding on that last part. They, clearly, she is being used as a product from someone like Ed Stetzer, who treated her like the cash cow of Bation at Lifeway those many years. But there's a second group, and that second group, well, well, you'll see, homosexuals, look at this from Beth Moore. She says, and this is a tweet that we shared the other day, 
Uh, for those who need further clarity on why I drop some of my commentary from the prayer book, Praying God's Word, it won't be enough, it won't make anyone happy, but it's where I landed on it. Now, we discussed this on Saturday's podcast, how her letter, uh, the, uh, the, the her blog post on Living Proof Ministries, it didn't call homosexuality a sin. It wasn't explicit. She just said, I have a traditional biblical view of human sexuality but didn't say what it was. What is it? However, let's look and see how this hom- how the homosexual community took it. Oh, excuse- forgive me. A community is a group of people who have a common set of shared values, and sexual deviancy is not a value, so it's not really a community. But the LGBT lobby, here's one. This is from Anita, 1956. As a Christian who happens to be gay and married for 17 years to my wife, according to 1 Corinthians 6, if that's who you are, and that's not who you were, you are deceived. Paul begins by saying, be not deceived. Do you not know that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God? But for 17 years, that's who this woman has been, and that's who she still is. But as a Christian who happens to be gay and married for 17 years to my wife, I obviously don't agree with your conclusions, but I so appreciate where you've softened your words for the sake of those who have been wounded and broken by God's word. Excuse me. No, no, no. Let me take back the God's word part. That was my paraphrase. I'm so glad that you've softened your words for the sake of those who've been so wounded and broken by just blanket condemnation and judgment, which is what God's word does about homosexuality. It's not like a gray zone. It's not like uh, adiaphora. It's not Christian liberty. It's not a gray area. It's very black and white. Don't sodomize people or willingly be sodomized. If you're a woman, don't lay with another woman as you would a man, giving up natural affections, as Paul says in Romans 1. And don't be gross sexually. Don't break the seventh commandment. Sexual relations are for one who is married, and by definition that is between a woman and a man. That is a blanket condemnation, and it's a judgment that sin is wrong. And if we are to judge a tree by its fruit, the fruit of the gay community is AIDS and death and dying and humiliation and suicide and high-risk behavior that leads to an early morbidity. So it's sin on multiple grounds. We can judge it. We should judge it. And yet she's really thrilled that Beth Moore has softened her tone on homosexuality. Thank you, Beth Moore. Gay folks really love it, and now they assume that they are gay and a Christian because you've softened your speech here. Um, Let me see here. Then Queer Christian Fellowship tweeted, A mother of a gay son wrote to Beth Moore LPM, see what she shared. A whole post from a woman with a gay son. So... Thankful about Beth Moore. Beth Moore has been so good to the gay community. Beth Moore is going to quickly become like the evangelical version of Madonna. You know how homosexuals love Madonna? It's all about Madonna, Madonna, Madonna. That's how homosexuals are going to be about this woman any day now. Lori Lambert says, It's long the, uh, long time that we stop following these far-right leaders. Remember, Beth Moore called us hyper-fundamentalists. She says, it's a long time uh, that we stop, it's long time that we stop following these far-right leaders and focus on Jesus' mission. Now, what is Jesus' mission? Immigrant (laughs) children, immigrants, love, and acceptance to the LGBTQ community. I kind of forget where in the scripture Jesus went out on a limb for the LGBTQ quote-unquote community. And also, don't forget abolishing the patriarchy. Beth Moore, she says, please lead this fight. And of course, Beth Moore is. Meredith Indemar says, I will be eternally grateful to Rachel Held Evans for making my letter uh, to the... Hold on a second. My admins are distracting me. 
Hold on. Yes, yes, I know. My microphone. The audio stinks. I recognize this. I've got to get Edgar back on this. I got a new board and then ended up setting up the old board. Stop detra distracting me, Tim Hurd. Um, although I will cut back on the game just a little bit and see if that helps. No, where was I at? Meredith says, I'll be eternally grateful to Rachel Helda Evans. Now, you remember who that is. That's the dead heretic. Like, she recently died. Um, for making my letter to Beth Moore go viral a few years ago. Moms of LGBTQ, LGBTQ kids, we have a voice and we've been heard. So here you have a gaggle of LGBTQ moms crediting Rachel Held Evans for the change of view, because they recognize that clearly it's a change of view, of Beth Moore. Nice. Uh, Red Larson, Rad Larson says, please speak your convictions for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of LGBTQ people who are unsure of where they stand with God, because so many pastors, preachers, and teachers are vague. Please speak your convictions. And because she has a rainbow flag, I'm willing to think that she... Uh, is winding up on the diff I might say the same thing like just speak your convictions LGBTQ people don't know where they stand with God just say what you're thinking but w when a lesbian says that I'm willing to think that she thinks Beth Moore falls on the other side of the issue um, Anna Michelle Gray says if nothing else the uproar over Beth Moore LPM shows why intersectionality is so important the defenders of the SBC go after straight cis women and LGBTQ people in other words Beth Moore is now being embraced as a fellow victim with her own identity status even as a cisgendered woman by the LGBTQ community so come on in for a group lesbian hug. Jean uh, says, Stand strong, Beth. You'll get through this. My kids were kicked out of the Christian school they had attended for seven years because my hubs and I refused to sign a document that legally protected them when they expelled students on the basis of being LGBTQ. So it was hard but worth it. In other words, LGBTQ people unite around Beth Moore. Dina uh, Holmes says, I'm part of the LGBTQ, and frankly, I'm tired of Christians using the Bible to thwack us over the head. Jesus never told you to shun us. Actually, he, no, not really shun, but to treat as a Gentile and, and a tax collector. To refuse to serve us, we probably should not refuse to serve, just FYI, uh, LGBTQ, XYZ, LMNOP, uh, couples, uh, people, unless they want us to help them celebrate their sodomy, at which point we're like, no, no, we're not doing that. Okay. Uh, Jesus would not make a gay wedding cake and uh, try to use the law to coerce us, but you're doing it. And you do it to people like Miss Moore as well. So the homosexual people are looking at the conservatives going, look what you're doing to Beth Moore. She's one of us. Quit victimizing Beth. Beth Moore. So who's on her team? Just to reiterate, Ed Stetzer and the Gospel Coalition guys on one hand, and look down here, Matthew Vines, that homosexual kid, the God and the gay Christian kid. Uh, Matthew Vines says, I'm grateful for Beth Moore's decision here. I've heard from LGBTQ Christians in recent years, no such thing by the way, whose parents were still citing this now deleted section to justify rejecting their children. So I appreciate Beth's willingness to listen to their stories and make this change. By the way, when you listen to someone's stories, instead of listening to the scripture, you are elevating men and their emo emotions over God. But I just want you, I want you to understand this. When you hear about stories, that's a pillar of what we call critical race theory. Critical race theory, CRT, does not just apply to race. It applies to any identity group within identity politics. So it refers to women. It refers to college students. It refers to uh, abuse victims. It refers uh, to homosexuals. So CRT isn't just about race. It's about any identity group whatsoever. And a foundational pillar of critical race theory is storytelling. Why is that? Well, 
they can't objectively prove that systemic racism or systemic misogyny or systemic homophobia exist. There's no law that indicates that these things exist. Like, there's no law discriminating against homosexuals or there's no law discriminating uh, against um, ethnic minorities and there hasn't been since the days of Jim Crow. Um, they can't demonstrate factually, statistically, that there's systemic bias against these people. So instead, they have to rely upon anecdotal storytelling. I know that one guy, and he would look down poorly because he was black. Do you have statistics that say this is happening across the board? Because unfortunate, bigoted things happen to white folks too, and brown folks, and red folks, and yellow folks, uh, all over the place. But it's not necessarily, you don't know necessarily, it's because they're white, red, black, or yellow. So they have to rely on storytelling, anecdotes, personal anecdotes. And then they're like, well, are you going to tell me my experience is wrong? Or are you going to try to disagree with my own personal experience? Instead of being able to factually, objectively prove that society has, has stacked the deck against them. So thank you, Matthew Vines, the most prominent, quote-unquote, gay Christian in the world. Thank you, Beth Moore for being on our side. John Collins says, beautifully explained and deeply profound. <laughs> if you read it, it's not, it's not profound. I hope we can follow Beth Moore's example, not only in reconciliation with our own past, but in the healing, in healing the division uh, caused by our hypocrisy and exclusion of the LGBTQ community in our churches. So the homosexuals are looking at what Beth Moore has done and said, uh, or they're now saying, she's working on full inclusion. Where there's fog in the pulpit, there's mist in the pew. So at least gays think they know where Beth Moore stands. Why are we still asking? If that's you, let me ask you, why are you still asking where Beth Moore stands on homosexuality? These folks know where she stands. Why don't you know where she stands? Uh, this next post, Paul White says, it is illegal for God to do anything on earth without your partnership. I should have HT'd the woman who sent me the email on this, and I've forgotten her name, but thanks for sending us a, uh, a heads up, all of you. Thanks for sending Pulpit and Pen a, uh, a heads up news-wise and giving us links to news articles so that we have them before anyone else does and we can get our voice out there and it can be heard. That's, that's, kind of, that's why we like being ahead of the news curve. Number one, it gives people incentive to read Pulpit and Pen because if you want the news to be new and fresh, uh, you come to PNP because we're going to have it before the Christian Post does or before Christianity Astray uh, or any of these other publications. But secondly, it allows our voice not to be drowned out by the chorus when we're the first ones saying it. So it gets our perspective out there. So we appreciate those news links. Um, so thanks to the woman who sent this. Paula White says it's illegal for God to do anything on earth without your partnership. And she preached at an event by Rodney Howard Brown known infamously as the Holy Ghost bartender. Uh, he's called that because he makes people quote unquote drunk in the spirit where they pass out and they act like fools. And White said this. She said you have, well, let me just play it for you. And again, the audio here will be especially distorted after I'm done playing it. It's only 30 seconds or so, maybe a minute. Then I'll read it to you, and uh, yeah. I may have to skip. Hold on, 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 hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. you power, I've already given you jurisdiction and goal for the nations are yours, saith the Lord. And it's not only with President Trump, he's given us Australia now. He's going to give us many other nations. Come on, there are nations. There's an end time harvest coming right now, and you have been called as a reaper. You have dominion. And while you're waiting on the Lord, the Lord's been waiting on you this whole time because it's illegal for God to do anything in the earth unless he partners with somebody. So she says... You have dominion, 
And while you've been waiting for God, he's been waiting for you this whole time. So imagine God in heaven going, come on, guys, can we do, can, can I do something now? Or, you know how you go on a road trip with your kids and you've got a bunch of snotty kids in the back of the car. And they're like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Can we stop? Can we do something? Mom, it's time to eat. I want a snack. Mom, please. That's who their God is. So he's in heaven. He's like, come on, guys. I'd like to do something about this but I need permission. She says, you have dominion. And while you've been waiting for God, God's been waiting for you. So he's on our timetable. Listen, let me introduce you to my friend, God. You're on his timetable. Trust me. He's not on yours. And so uh, he says, she says rather, uh, well, I say he, maybe the demons that are in her, uh, for he's been waiting for you this whole time because quote it's illegal for God to do anything on earth unless he partners with somebody so it is illegal for God to do anything on earth unless he partners with somebody so her idea is because there is the dominion mandate of Genesis 128 God literally needs your permission because he's given dominion to you in order for him to do anything. However, the problem with that is we have uh, the scripture that says things slightly uh, differently. Um, Psalm 103, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. That includes earth too, by the way. Listen to Daniel chapter 4 verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say to his hand or say to him, what have you done? God does whatever it is that he wants. As a matter of fact, that's what Psalm 115, 31, or verse 3 says. Our God is in the heavens, and he does all that he wants. Or what about Job in Job 42, 2? I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours might be thwarted. Where do you have room for a God who's like, come on, guy, please let me do something about it. I want to do something about the elections in Australia, but I don't, I, I need permission. Could somebody partner with me? This is synergism on steroids. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So what she's doing here is basically disagreeing with the omnipotence and also the sovereignty of God. But that's not the only heretical thing that she said at the Rodney Howard Brown event. Uh, she also went on to say, I don't know if it's in the same sermon, but it was certainly at the same place, that, uh, as you can see the title of this post, Paul White says, wherever she steps becomes holy ground. I'll spare you the video, but she says, the church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything, including the White House and including government halls. And so she continued, how does he do that? He does that through you. So he fills, like, the White House and so forth, the dry cleaner, through you. Wherever I go, she says, God rules. When I, except when you were having an affair in a hotel room in Europe with Benny Hinn. I'm pretty sure God wasn't ruling you then. You strange woman. Wherever I go, God rules. When I walk on the White House grounds, God walks on the White House grounds. When I walk in the river, God walked in the river. She's talking about the name of the church, the river. Uh, hey, how, how about this? Jesus walked on actual water. Let me see you do that. Let me see you. Let me see you walk on actual water. Uh, when I go to the dry cleaners, that dry cleaning place becomes holy. And so in true word faith fashion, White says, quote, I have every right and authority to declare the White House as holy ground because I was standing there and where I stand is holy. You might be saying to yourself, does she think she's God? And the answer is yes. That's what word faith theology is. That's what the New Apostolic Reformation teaches. Like, that's, that's their theology. It's called little God theology. That Jesus was emptied of his deity. This is called the kenotic gospel, kenosis, it to be emptied. 
And he did miracles by faith, not by the fact that he was divine, but by faith. Therefore, even though we're not technically divine, by faith we can do the exact same things that Jesus did. And that we are tiny little gods, just like the one true God. Tiny little gods. So you can decree and declare things, and wherever you happen to stand, that's holy ground. At which point the rest of us go, no, I don't think so. Commercial break, we'll be right back. Maybe, maybe commercial. Did I mention Crown and Cross books out of Indiana? Let me let me see if I can get their ad going here. Hold on a minute. This message is brought to you by crownandcross.org, where we provide rare books from some of the greatest minds of the Christian faith. We also provide children's books, resources to help your children grow in the faith. Our goal is to help you grow in holiness to the Lord. So please visit crownandcross.org. This message is brought to you by crownandcross.org. Alrighty then, so uh, let's get to some sincere questions. Again, if you have a sincere question, email me jd at pulpitandpin.org or talk back at pulpitandpin.org. I don't know. If it's important, I'll forward it to me. Uh, Richard asked the question in the email, and that is, uh, can a true Christian wander into heretical teaching and be restored and brought back by God's grace? Or does the wandering automatically prove that they weren't a true Christian? And the answer is... No, the wandering does not prove automatically that they're not a true Christian. However, if they're in the midst of heretical teaching, it would be unwise for us to consider them a Christian, but it doesn't mean that they're indeed uh, lost or could not be saved. We will never know who the reprobate are um, in the same way that we don't know who the elect are, because we're, we're not God. So we need to be very careful with the doctrine of reprobation, and that means someone uh, will never be saved regardless. And the doctrine of reprobation is very clear. I mean, it's taught in places like John chapter 3, verse 18, but our job is to preach the gospel to every creature. And I think that God takes special pleasure in saving people that the world would look on saying he would never save. Like the, the Apostle Paul would be a good example. But God is glorified when people who would appear to us to be hopeless when they're indeed saved. That's glorious. Like when I had Stephen Anderson on the podcast, which was not because I was endorsing him, certainly, uh, we differed on the subject of homosexuals. He believed that they were reprobate, that they could not be saved. Sorry, I believe in a gospel that's better news than what you've got. <laughs> I believe in a God who's bigger than the one that you have. I believe in a Savior who's better than the one that you're preaching. Uh, he's a God who can save homosexuals. God uh, can save lots of people. And, let me throw this in there too, for most believers, uh, God has a leash. He has a leash on us, I like to say. Some people have a longer leash than others, meaning that they can wander farther or further is it farther or further if my mother was here she would tell me uh, from God than than others so like when I see someone depart I mean I have a church and you know we've had you know a hundred people in it for a decade uh, when 
That's right, not a megachurch, sue me. Although it is a Reformed Baptist megachurch, which is any Reformed Baptist church of more than 20 people. So, uh, when I've seen people depart over the years into sin or false teaching, my attitude is, well, let's wait and see. See if God brings them back. And there's been times where I thought that it was just hopeless and they get real back. God's like, I'm not letting you get away forever. I'm the good shepherd that leaves the 99 and finds the one. And that's true even for those who are engaged uh, or who have adopted for a short time some type of heretical view. Uh, it doesn't necessarily prove that they were a false Christian. The reason I say that is because of place, places like Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, where it appears as though Peter has adopted to some extent the Judaizing heresy, either that or he's chill with it. His behavior seems to indicate that he thinks the, the Judaizers are legit. Uh, he's trying to appease them by his behavior. And Paul says, I rebuked him to his face. And this is the apostle Peter, uh, who is on the wrong side of the heterodoxy, heresy, orthodoxy divide. He's, he's not acting orthodox, at the very least, and yet he, you, you couldn't say that he was unsaved and had, or, or had to be, quote-unquote, resaved, or that he wasn't yet regenerate. This is one of the reasons why we should insist that if you're a believer, get your tail to church. You're a sheep. You're not made to be out there in the pasture by yourself. You need other sheep because you're a flock animal, and you need a pastor. And I've seen people who are legitimately believers, born again, uh, begin to, for a time, chase after weird, stupid ideas. Because when they're outside the church, they get wonky. Their theology gets weird. Uh, it, 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 just gets, it just gets bizarre sometimes. But we would look to places like John chapter 10 and say, but a sheep know his voice, and they'll follow him, and eventually they'll find their way out. And I've seen that happen even in recent months, where I was really worried about somebody engaged in sectarian minimalism, and lo and behold, they've come out of it. Why? Why did they come out of it? Because they did belong to God. They, they did know their, their shepherd's voice. They wouldn't forever ignore it. They would hear it, and they would follow. And so when someone adopts or embraces... Um, some, something that is heretical or borders heretical, pray for them as though they're not a Christian, but understand that it doesn't mean that God won't save them or that they aren't momentarily running off on the leash and they're going to hit the end of that any day now and be drugged back. So j just to be extra clear, um, I'm not saying that we should consider one born again if they're in the midst of heretical belief. We shouldn't. But at the same time, whether or not we consider someone born again doesn't necessarily mean that they're not or that they are. Like what we would assume safely about someone's salvation has no bearing about, uh, has no bearing on whether or not God will indeed, in fact, save them or if he already has. Does that make sense? Uh, let me go on to another question. Clears mud, I'm sure. Uh, this one is from Adam. Uh, I have a good question for you, uh, or good morning, I have a question for you. Have you ever heard or seen a church have a seminary student preach on a Sunday morning? Our church has had a young man who's in seminary preach twice, and I guess he's supposed to preach two more times before he goes back to school. I was wondering if that was something a church should be doing for a Sunday morning service. My wife and I feel like it was not appropriate for Sunday. Any insight you could provide would be much appreciated. Thank you for your time. And one of the things I do as a polemicist is tell people when it's okay to just chill and when it's it's not a big deal or big issue. Um, one of the problems when it comes to preaching is the church prefers usually the guy that usually preaches to them and and it's usually the the lead pastor sometimes you might call them a senior pastor the teaching pastor. Um, we as reformed Christians believe in a 
in a, uh, a plurality of elders as opposed to a mono-episcopate view with just one pastor. We believe in multiple elders. But even in a church with multiple elders, there's usually one that takes the bulk of the teaching responsibility upon themselves. And if they don't, if they want to split up all their time, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they play musical pulpits. The church is still going to typically follow after one guy, ordinarily. Even though they respect the other elders and they see them as elders and they know that they have authority, usually one guy. And it is annoying to have other people preach. It's annoying to sit through sermons of someone who may not be a good preacher because he's a seminary student. But one of our jobs is to equip the saints for ministry. And there are some churches that it seems to me that God has them with a unique ministry of helping young ministers. They're like a starter church. It's a horrible way to think about it, but it, it, it does happen. And I, I don't think that it's due to any fault of that particular church where they, for 50 years, they've had young ministers that have a tendency to move on. Somebody has to endure bad sermons in order for that pastor or preacher that seminary student to become skilled at his craft, at what he's doing. Now, some people will just never be fluent. That's just the way that it is. But hopefully they can learn to better exposit the Word of God and to more carefully handle it. And so it's actually the responsibility of the entire church to invest in those people who may not be that skilled in their gifting, but to just suck it up and endure it. Because, after all, the pastor that you have now is going to die. Somebody's going to have to replace him. You don't want them to be a newbie. And so the pastor should be sharing that pulpit very responsibly, of course. And for the purpose of training, the pastor should be sharing that pulpit on occasion. It doesn't have to be Sunday morning, but young men do need an opportunity to preach. That being said, the first place that a young minister should be preaching is the street corner. It should be in the open open air. If you haven't the courage to preach in the open air, you probably haven't the courage to preach behind the pulpit. Uh, they should be preaching in places like jails and nursing homes. It doesn't have to be the Sunday morning crowd, but it's not a bad thing. We can chill with that. It's a good thing. And when it's not that great of a sermon, I'll just remind you, I think it was Spurgeon who said, um, I may not... Uh, there may be others who can preach the gospel better, but there's none who can preach a, a better gospel. And that's true even when you have to endure a sermon that, frankly, is just not that good. So, um, Reverend Hall Clark says, Thanks for the work you're doing pointing out Beth Moore's disqualifications for her, her assumed position is needed. To the whiners, I suppose they never read Paul when he called out men in the church by name and to be kicked out and avoided. One thing I caught in Miss Moore's tweet was her self-identification as a witch, and it seemed to be overlooked by others. She actually called herself a witch, Egad. Reminds me of a story I saw on Drudge last week. Let me see if I can pull this up for you real quick. And uh, on on the computer. If, if you don't know what he's talking about, Beth Moore said, I'm not the first witch that's going to be found in this witch hunt, at which point the rest of us are like, are you saying that you're a witch? Are you <laughs> admitting this? Uh, of course, my attitude is, as I've often said, sometimes, you know, the thing about a witch hunt is sometimes you find actual witches. Um, sorry, that's not my website with the girls in their swimsuits. Uh, witches were first... Feminists says, what does that say? Says Paris Star. All right. Uh, so witches were the first feminists. Said, what is what is that? Uh, a, uh, a model? I don't know. So anyways, Beth Moore calls herself a witch, and feminists are the first witches. So, reader drawing a parallel there, maybe, or it could be stretching it. By the way, back to this guy. Uh, here, here's what I want to point out. He, uh, the seeker-friendly big box church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, decided to cancel church on the Lord's Day, calling it a summer Sabbath so that everyone could go to the beach. Guys, we don't need... Oh, break. We don't need a Sabbath from worship. 
because the worship is our Sabbath. And there's disagreements over whether or not the Lord's Day is the New Testament Sabbath and a fulfillment of the Fourth Commandment, or if the Fourth Commandment has been abrogated. You know where I stand, um, because I, I hold the covenant theology. And so I thought, how could I end this article in a way that would make everybody happy? And that is, um, oh, where did it go? Where did the line go? While there are differences of opinion in Christendom as to whether or not the fourth commandment is fulfilled by the New Testament Sabbath day on Sunday or whether Sunday worship is simply the Lord's day as distinct from the Old Testament command, it's clear that one day out of seven should be a day of worship set apart for the Lord. So we can all agree to that. There should be one day out of seven set aside for the gathered assembly. And in the Old Testament, it was called a convocation. Call a convocation, uh, a convocation for the Lord. Exodus chapter 12, verse 16. The Sabbath was a convocation. So the idea of some, especially dispensationalists, that in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was they, they just huddled in their homes. No, they didn't. They traveled and they got together just like we do now. And, and also we're told in, in places like Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together especially to go to the beach. And if you're so secret sensitive, you're canceling church to appease people, you got uh, problems, theological problems. Uh, let me go to the next question, maybe. Uh, I don't know if it's a question. JD, this is from Dan, and he says, you're one of the few uh, that I look for and read all of your articles. I watched your first class on understanding the social gospel movement, but I haven't seen anything since then. Okay, so go to Sermon Audio and look up the series on social justice and you can find about half a dozen. I'm giving more of these lectures, the other set of lectures, or there's eight, there's eight of them I think. You're going to find the other eight in a few weeks. I'm going to preach them at different churches in the Bible Belt uh, as I'm, I'm making a tour through uh, Arkansas and Missouri in, uh, in July. I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and two of the three megachurches are extremely into the social gospel movement, and they have been for 45 years, and it's growing big time. I went to a uh, thing they sponsored a few months ago, which featured Kevin Palau, which is Luis's son, as the main speaker. Most of the attendees were college kids, praising God for the work of your ministry, my brother. Not a social media guy, but I've shared your PNP articles with my friends. Thank you. And I just got an article, not an article, an email today saying someone has come out with a new homeschool curriculum meant to combat social justice. And my lectures on social justice are going to be put into a Sunday school curriculum. So I, I hope that there's progress being made as people are trying to combat, um, people are trying to combat the social justice movement that way. Um, all right, we'll stop there. Going a little bit long, I think, maybe. Who knows? Um, support us on Patreon if you can. That makes a huge, huge help. Also, we're being severely throttled on Facebook, just like most other conservative news outlets are, which means you need to go directly to the website. Don't rely on the feed showing up. Don't rely on seeing those things come across your, uh, your Facebook page or your Facebook feed. You need to go out of your way to find it. Pulpitandpin.org. Thanks, everybody. Oh, by the way, join the pulpit bunker or the wingnut wall. If you're listening, you're listening on the Bible Thumping Wingnut. God bless you, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. And until then, as always, Semper Reformanda. This podcast is part of the Bible Thumping Wingnut Network. Biblical Christianity's marketplace of ideas. BibleThumpingWingnut.com